Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of In the Pit with your host, Lobo Tigre. Our victim of the day is Lara Smith. She's COO and Executive Director of Molten Metals. Molten Metals, we have molten batteries and all kinds of cool things to talk about, antimony or antimony, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So this is a little off the beaten path, an interesting topic. Lara, why don't you give us a quick overview about what your company is doing, and then I've got questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for that introduction. So molten metals, you accurately described, we're doing a roll up of antimony assets or antimony assets. Um, globally, we've got four projects. One is in Canada, in Nova Scotia, another three are in Slovakia. Um, often some minor metals occur with that. So one of our projects in Slovakia is tin, but the other two are antimony gold assets. And uh, yeah, we, we're going to bring those into production, hopefully. So we're in development stage and we, we're moving those projects forward. Okay. Well, that was admirably concise. Um, now there is, I, I want to talk about the rocks and what you're doing, all that good stuff. That's what really matters for adding value for shareholders. But there is a controversy with your former CEO, your COO. There is no COEO right now. Can you give us a little brief summary of what's going on and and how you see that your side of the story yeah so so just just one correction um when chris resigned as ceo i assumed the role of ceo um okay and ceo was taken on by john harris and we intend to augment the board and we, we've proposed some other um people who have agreed to come onto the board so we are a full board um and there's no interim play here um, yeah, so the controversy happened um, in a board meeting on the 23rd of December. Whenever you call a board meeting in that time of the year, I think it never goes well. Um, but this particular story really happened over, over a strategy in Slovakia. And I hadn't gone. I mean, first we started this company during COVID. And then for a number of reasons, I hadn't gone. Chris had gone um, to see the asset. John Harris had gone to see the asset. But I eventually went to Slovakia in December, early December. Um, and I went with the purposes of, of trying to, to work out where to put, um, the processing plant that we had bought. And, um, I stood there with several engineers far smarter than I did, than I am. And, um, they eventually said to me, well, how big is this plant? I mean, they were just discussing, do we put it into a, a double volume place, a single volume place? And eventually I was like, but this is 10 tons per day this is not you can put this into you know you put this into warehouses not such a big deal and that kind of everybody stopped at that point and they said but why are you erecting such a small plant so I said well it's a pilot and we're going to move forward with the pilot plant and and then we'll go forward from them and eventually one of them said to me but do you have a license so I said well we've got a processing license it comes with that um, not a mining license. We're not mining. We're taking above ground stocks. And also, um, what you need to understand is there's two things you need to understand about antimony. Is very often it's amenable to pre-sorting because you can see it with the naked eye. And that is done all over the world through hand sorting. If you go to Pakistan, if you go to Burma, if you go to Turkey, Zimbabwe, there many people hand sort it by using small, small scale mining techniques. And if you get a grade of rock over the, the cutoff is probably about 20%, 25%. You don't actually have to concentrate it. I mean, you would if you want to get further value, but you can send that and many roses will accept it. So that becomes a saleable product. So, so that, that's the first thing you need to understand. And the second thing in Slovakia, there's no maximum as to what, it, what constitutes a bulk sample and what mm. constitutes mining. And what Chris had intended to do was to hand sort or pre-sort, um, what's what I understand from him is what he wanted to do, was to pre-sort that all, which wouldn't have been a bad strategy, and use the concept that we are bulk sampling to start opening up edits and at least process some of the material and, and, and try to work it out. Now, that, that was flawed for a couple of reasons. Um, one is there's no such thing as a small-scale mining license in Europe. So you can't replicate really um, what you do in Zimbabwe and other places without getting 
a full-scale mining license. You get a full-scale mining license, and then, yes, you can pre-sort and use, use people to hand-sort it, but you can't get a small-scale license. Um, the second thing is that while bulk sampling, you can do it, and there's no maximum, practicalities work something like this. And this is what was basically told to me. They said, he said, my dear, the way you want to process 150 tons, that's five trucks. By the time somebody's complained, and somebody will complain because it's going to go through a village and these people are old. Um, by the time anybody's complained, you'll be told, okay, you're bulk sampling, terribly sorry for the inconvenience, and you'll be on your way. Um, and nothing's going to happen. Scale that up to 1,000 tons, 2,000 tons, whatever you want. Keep opening edits and keep doing this. Somebody's going to complain. And then they're going to say, you're mining without a license. And then we're going to say, we bulk sampling. And you are not Slovakian. So good luck winning that one. And it was at that point <laughs> where I said to Chris, look, I think we need to rethink this, this whole strategy. And perhaps the thing to do is to not set up a processing plant, but um, to actually, you know, the, 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 the historic resource on at least one of those edits uh, on one of those properties, if we can assume the historic is correct, and we, we can't assume that because it's not a 943101 compliant resource or anything, but if we can assume it's correct for a moment and the price of antimony is higher, which it is, then it would warrant the effort of going into development. And that means applying for the relevant licenses. And um, he was adamant that if we stop the Svedla operation, that um, he would do what he wanted to do. Uh, he would you know, leave and, and you know, good, good luck with the, the ramifications. And I, to me, it was like a no brainer. You, it's, even if I wanted to proceed, you, you can't proceed because you could open yourself up to potential litigation, if nothing else. Never mind the fact that it, I mean, I was trying to run the sums recently, just opening up one, just on one edit. And it doesn't, I mean, it will, assuming you get it right, it would recover some of the costs. It would never be profitable. So you would still need to go through the effort of getting a license and then going into this commercial plant. And then also to balance a processing plant and to, to formulate a process, everything works in theory, but until you've actually tested that all and run it through that process and then set it up, you, you don't know what you're going to recover. And when I spoke to John Harris, being our engineers and then the Slovakian engineers, they said, look, you need about 150 tons just to balance that processing machine and to make sure that you can recover it. So I was like, well, there's your, there's your all. It's gone because you haven't done any metallurgical test work. Um, so all of those things considered, practically, economically, legally, uh, it just didn't make sense to proceed that way. Well, I've got a million questions from there, but we'll try to stay focused. What I'm hearing is actually the conventional wisdom in the industry of go big or go home. I mean, if you're going to do it, you should do it properly. And I'll tell you, the, the worst mistakes I've made as a resource speculator have been betting on people that built a mine without properly studying it first. And, you know, there's a reason why there are best practices in the industry. Yeah. So that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and uh, by the way, your PowerPoint needs updating because it still shows you as COO. And that's why I said that. But we'll make sure to get your proper oh, title in there. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I, I do want to talk about the Roxon, but just real quickly. I mean, it sounds smart. You stepped in, but tell us a little bit more about who you are and why should we trust you to, to do this right? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So I have an analyst background. My qualifications, um, I've got a BSc in chemistry and economics, statistics. I went on to study financial analysis, portfolio management, um, cut my teeth as an analyst. Um, on the buy side, so I do. I am very sensitive to to investors. I then joined a diversified fund doing M and A in the Baltics and Africa, um, and that's where I really learned mining. Because before that, it was um, I, I was analyzing pretty much everything from gaming stocks to <laughs> to mining. And eventually, actually, my CIO said, "Look, if you want a career in South Africa." you better learn the mining industry. Um, because I'd come out from university and I just did not want to be in mining. 
because everything in chemistry, you either went into petroleum or you went into to mining. And so by the time I was finished a chemistry degree, I was sick of it. Um, so that got thrown me back into mining, probably something which I was always meant to do. In 2009, I opened up Core Consultants, which was the first dedicated mining consultancy on the economic side in Africa. Um, there were other consultancies. It was McKinsey and Bain, and but they were they had they weren't only focused on mining. So I only did the economic analysis for mines, and through that I've got a huge network of engineers, geologists. Um, a lot of my work came from projects either from banks or from engineering teams who were doing feasibility studies and pre-feasibility studies. So I've traveled the world with that for about ten years. Um, I wrote two lithium books. I wrote a rare earth report for monthly. I've, I've been to, to some of the best mines uh, doing that. And uh, yeah, that was me from 2009 until um, I met Chris a couple of years ago. Uh, big meeting of the mines. Uh, we were working on Alphaman and I introduced him to Alphaman. And um, so I started getting more into tin. I've always been interested in the minor metals. But I always say, if you're going to be an analyst and a commodity analyst, you, you eat with coal and iron ore. So, <laughs> but but minor metals all have their, their day in the sun. And so it was a, a strong meeting with the mines there. He was always into antimony. Um, he was even he was into antimony even at the wrong time, and then he recorded <laughs> right at the right time. It is now very much the right time. Um, and right, well, sorry, let's let's go ahead with that. Uh, Make, if you can, the quick case for antimony. I would guess that most of our audience, even if they call it antimony, uh, you know, they've heard of it, but they don't really know what it's used for and, and why now. Uh, mm. So antim antimony is an extremely old metal um, and it's got a myriad of different uses. But today, about half of that is on um, heat retardants. So one of the properties of antimony as a metal is it's a cooling agent. So as a result, anything that needs thermal retardation, you, know, you put some antimony in. So there's some antimony in your cell phone batteries. There's, um, a lot of the use goes into um, children's clothing, for instance, so it doesn't catch a light. And so that it takes up about 50% of the market just over. Then it's an artillery. Um, we went into the defense industry, hardening bullets, um, precision missiles. Um, and that's been used, gosh, antimony was mined um, in the First World War, it was mined again in the Second World War, um, and that always seemed to follow, if you go follow the patterns of antimony, whenever there was strife, you, you had antimony. But um, now more than ever, because what we're trying to do in the world is decarbonize and scale the batteries, and, you know, one of the things about um, using these uh, various metals in batteries is it's, it gives off a highly um, exothermic reaction. So it's it's very volatile. So if you start scaling lithium, for instance, and, and I used to be a chemistry teacher. So one of the things I used to do is drop a little bit of lithium and go around the water um, and you don't let anybody touch it or anything. But if you start scaling that up, um, you open yourself up to a lot of heat. So what they're trying to do now with the molten liquid salt batteries is to use antimony as the base metal to allow those batteries to scale. So those batteries um, would be used to store uh, renewable energy and feed it to the grid. So you're into mass storage. And already just on the thermal retardation, the defense and all the existing um, applications for antimony, you're already in a very balanced, arguably deficit market, I would argue in a deficit market um, for that. And now if you want to scale um, the mass batteries and that gets widespread adoption, we're into a hugely deficit market. All right. No well, obvious supply sources. But I, just real quick, how would this compare to say the vanadium flow batteries, which don't need heat? I mean, the whole idea of a, of a molten salt battery it just sounds less efficient to have to heat something up, keep it in the right state, keep it the heat from escaping and so on, versus yeah. something that you can just have in a cargo container sitting anywhere. Yeah, because it's solid states, the vanadium. 
So, no, no, they're 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 redox okay. flow batteries. They're so the, the redox size flow of a, batteries of a semi trailer. Mm, sorry, you see, talk about the redox flow. Um, look, all the studies that I've done on and on vanadium redox batteries, I would say that is the one that competes. It is extremely expensive to commission a vanadium mine. I've looked at this; it, it's extremely expensive. Um, also, what you have is you compete all the time for ferro vanadium, so. That's why you haven't seen this wide scale adoption of vanadium uh, redox batteries. So if you so you've had um, I actually studied this a couple of years ago, so my mind's going. But three years ago, I think they introduced the um, the rebar standard three batteries. Right. So it's steel steel rebar, um, and that again sent vanadium running upwards, and anything that could have gone into um, the redox flow batteries, and which is only about two percent of the market. Um, that all went into ferro vanadium. So you need the right price of vanadium in order to um, make your case for vanadium redox batteries. All right. So let's say the molten uh, the molten uh, <laughs> antimony battery is the preferred choice. What kind of time frame? I mean, I don't I don't know if anybody that's building these on scale. I mean, maybe a pilot somewhere project, but. Do we really need to mine this now? I mean, I can see getting ready, but I'm, I'm as an investor, as a speculator, looking for a hockey stick, you know, a price mm -hmm. chart. Uh, are we getting the cart before the horse here? No, no, you're not, because there's one uh, major company called Ambry. They come out of MIT. Donald Sadaway is actually um, on our advisory board. He's the founder of Ambry. Ambry is backed by every major person with money on this planet. And they've gone into commercial production this year. And they Making have batteries. signed commercial battery production this year. And they're already buying some antimony. And if you start asking them about their rollout plans, and if you start following that company and um, the contracts, I mean, it's a private company, but the contracts that they put out that they have signed for 2024, 2026, it's going to involve quite a bit of antimony. In fact, I went, um, you know, when I had a conversation with Donald um, Sadaway about a year ago, and at the time he wanted um, antimony ingots. And I, and I just said, like, where? How, how are you getting this? Because antimony ingots is about 10% of the antimony market. So it's even less out of ingots there than, than there is trioxide. And he said, okay, well, he's actually going to go back to the drawing board and see if he can get some, if he can start using antimony with lower purity. Now, I don't know, I haven't had a follow-up call to see if that's even viable, but even with lower purity, where the antimony market is going now, it, it's going to be tough to fulfill those requirements. Okay, well, that is interesting. That leads naturally, though, to the question of when you have one of these, you, you said you like the oddball metals, you know? Um, I always hated the oddball metals. I mean, it's not that I don't get it. They can do spectacular things when there's a squeeze. But because they're off the beaten track, we have issues with transparency and pricing and all that. It, I mean, if I look at my Bloomberg, I can't even find in too many prices. But beyond that, there's also just, when you have such a small market, a single new supplier, if the Chinese have some mine that we don't know about that comes on mine, online next month, you know, how do you know, how does an investor know that something like that won't just swamp the market and crash the price? So your your biggest mines are falling in a big way. So your, your biggest mines of antimony, and antimony is one of those metals that have been extremely well explored um, because it's, it's one of the oldest metals. I mean, it was first identified, I think, in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's got the old apothecary symbols, actually. Um, so your biggest mine is in China, um, Twinkle Star, and that's been running, these, these mines run for years, that's been running for about 500 years, and the <laughs> Chinese are now buying, um, they're, they're now trying to buy anything and everything they get their hands on, because that is finally dwindling in terms of what their output is in their head grade. Your second largest was Consmerch in South Africa which was a very, it's now a very deep gold mine. And it's not, the mine itself is not economic. 
that closed uh, several years ago, there is stockpiles. Then your third largest is in Russia. Russia's doing what Russia's doing. And then you've got some in Australia, which is industrialized, not huge, but there is steady supply coming out of there. And the rest of it is small scale artisanal stuff. So you've got Turkey, which is quite quite decent, um, but largely uh, small scale mining. Um, Burma, Pakistan, <laughs> Bolivia. All right, wait, you're, you're walking me through the history here. I'm asking a forward looking question. But like if the Chinese years, have a 500 year old mine that's running down, how do we know they don't have plan B ready to go? I mean, would they, they tell us? Go because they keep phoning me. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Well, okay. Then there's also the byproduct question. You know, the times that I have run into antimony or antimony in the past, it's it's actually been always as a byproduct of a gold project. I, you know, I love gold mm -hmm. and I go see a gold mine and they're like, oh, well, we have this antimony or antimony and you know that could be an interesting credit and they never seem to do anything with it, it just kind of sits there you know is yeah. as these mines are built if it becomes economic you know how do we know that won't bring on new supply enough to move the market it can so some of the things which you see is like especially like bolivia which they'll mine it for its gold they'll store the antimony and then you'll you'll bring then you'll and then when the time is right they'll they'll sell the antimony so you do see that small volatility and the antimony price and market. But um, look, a lot of the gold opportunities, the percentage of antimony is either too low. They also compete in the process. So you, you're, not re you, you're never recovering maximum gold and maximum antimony. So you always have to choose. So if it's a gold mine predominantly and gold is up, you wouldn't necessarily choose to process antimony. So, mm, yeah, so not if it's going to cost you more than you get from yeah no well it's not that right? it costs you so the, the the what when you have to extract and so i'm not a process engineer where you extract the the reagents used to extract the gold compete with the reagents used to extract the antimony so you, you're killing one or the other so you're optimizing for recovery of both but if you're after the gold and you're after 100 of gold credits i mean there are some techniques now to allow you to isolate the two then you're losing the antimony and vice versa. Understood. So, so that's why you don't get these, these swings. And also a lot of the gold associated with, with arsenic or mercury, or, you know, high sulfur, which are the nasties if you're going to start selling antimony. Understood. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Let's talk about what you're doing then. You've got, I guess it's mostly the Slovakian projects is the focus now. Uh, yeah. Or do you have bandwidth to advance all of your projects at once, or do we do we bring? Um, throw you a, I, I'm not sure I can pronounce that got, right. We've got. Um, <laughs> For, bring that one online first, and then use the money to advance the rest, or what's the plan? That would be the plan. Look, we, we've we're bringing up um, West Gore, so we, we're busy digitizing the core samples on West Gore to see what's there. There's less info, even though West Gore is. A brownfields project it's historic it was historically producing um i think last time really um during the first world war um, we don't have an ni-43 compliant resource on that we know that it was not mined out we know from history it wasn't mined out but um, we do have core samples there's been quite a bit of exploration done some recent exploration um but we're away away from getting a resource there slovakia doesn't need an ni-43 101 compliant resource. You need a confirmation resource of the historic data. The Russians drilled and explored extensively there. So, you know, there is the question as to, I mean, I've never really seen a, a Russian project which had been drilled with, they got it wrong. They might've got it wrong on the metallurgy, but I don't think they've ever got it wrong on the actual quantity. But, you know, first time for everything. So we'll have to do some channel sampling and confirm that historic resource. And my, my idea there is because those assets are, there's a, there is a team is to concentrate on advancing that first. All right. So will there be uh, a 43101 resource before you go into production? And will there be a scoping study or a, feasi a full feasibility? Or, or what, what is the steps to get to production and cash flow here? 
Well, the steps for Slovakia is you don't need an NI43-101. You need, you need a resource statement. You need a review. So um, we- Okay, legally, the, but as a business, are you- No, no, no. Are, as a business as well. We, you know, I'm, I'm not in the, I'm not in academia. I don't want to sit and, and go through st unnecessary study after unnecessary study. I want a, a full resource that gives you enough confidence to, to build a business off. Now, if that is NI43-101 or if that is- um, you know, chalk or any other standard or Slovakian standard, that that's fine. Um, I want to be cost efficient and, and get to a point where, where I'm comfortable to develop a mine plan of that. Um, so we will comply with what um, Slovakia needs. And at the same time, we'll make sure that we have confidence in the resource before we progress. Um, so I'm not going to promise shareholders that it's going to be NI 43101. Um, and so Slovakia works slightly differently to Canada. Everything, Canada and Slovakia, they both start with the resource. Slovakia, you can do confirmation resource because there is a historic resource on some of those projects. Some of them you might want to extend that, that resource. Then um, you have to pay a, what's called a PDA, which is a deposit um, to say that you intend to develop a mine there and to please hold my land. Um, then you apply for your mining license, which is given on as a con, um, which is given to you contingent on completing a feasibility study and possibly an EIA. So that's the mechanism to get that. That, that whole exercise is somewhere between two and three years away. Um, and it, it seems, look, at, at current prices, even if current prices were to dip, um, and if we, and you have to have some basis for, for going forward with any business, and in my basis is I assume that what was done under the Soviet system was accurate or clear or, or close to accurate. And for that reason, I would pursue these projects. But as I understood you, to get the mining license, you would still need to produce some kind of study. It may, it may not all be 4311, but, the, yeah, but there will be a resource. There will be a study. Your resource. You need to confirm your resource. So we do need to, so you don't necessarily have to drill. You have to drill if you want to extend that resource, but you do have to sample. Right. So you do have okay. to open those edits, extend those edits where necessary, and then sample. And would you do a bulk sample to help pay for things going forward if you thought you could make some money from stockpiles sitting on surface? Or would you just take your time, breathe deep, and go unless into production when you're ready? Frankly, unless it is, um, I, I don't believe in wasting management time. So unless it's significant, um, then then yes. You know, if it was significant, we would have to, we have to sample, we have to do our metallurgical studies. Um, is it enough to, to be as a bulk sample? I don't know. Um, but, you know, you've got to remember that if you take payables, so let's just say you, everything's priced on, you ask about the price of antimony. The antimony is priced on payables, on contained metal. So if you have 100 kilograms of rock, well, let's make it easy, 100 tons of rock, the price of antimony today is $13,000. So let's make it easy numbers, you call it 10. So... You've got ten thousand dollars times by hundred tons, a million dollars worth. But if you've got twenty percent of that, then pay twenty percent of the metal price. So you've got twenty percent of a million, so it's two hundred thousand, and then you pay twenty percent on that. So your price, your your that costs that that total payable is forty forty thousand dollars. What does that pay for? Christmas bonuses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to, to, to sit in waste management time is if you can finance this properly, then you would only really bulk sample for that amount if you needed to test and, and truly if you needed to, you needed that amount. Um, so I wouldn't do that. It, it's better to keep your stockpiles, get it into production, get your flow sheets right, your metallurgical sheets right, and then you upgrade that. No, oh, I, I I agree. I'm I believe in the go big or go home. You know, it needs to be big enough to matter. But
But again, maybe it's outdated. I don't know. I'm looking at your PowerPoint and it says step one, establish processing plant at 10 to 15 tons per day. And that just seems like, you know, a bulk sample. Oh, seems... No, 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 no. You're, you're, um, you're reading the pre Chris one. <laughs> <laughs> There's a deck called okay. the wave Wood deck. All right. Um, okay. Well, good. You're, uh, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm reassured. I, you know, the, the, uh, <laughs> little mom and pop operations have have never delivered for me in the past so okay um and the other slovakia assets would it ultimately become a hub and spoke kind of thing or do you think any of them would be big enough i'm not going to try to pronounce the names but do uh, to justify you know doing the whole thing again somewhere else so so the truth is i don't know that in slovakia itself there's three assets there's um tenants grunt um, which is 10 kilometers of exploration concession. And only a little bit of that has been um, documented in terms of historic resource. It's not nearly enough to say, yes, we can go for it. And that's that's going to be a thing. So we'd have to explore further. Um, and that would require drilling if we want to now prove that up because you're proving up certain edits by scratch. Then we've got... Um, Medvedi Potok, which is uh, Bear Creek, which is the tin asset, which is pretty close. They're both in the east of the country. Um, that is has got low grade ore in the front of it, and then high grade veins. Those veins, um, according to the geologists, they've only gone down for two levels. They've gone, they've gone two levels of adits, which and they know that those veins run at one to two percent, one to two and a half percent, which is good for tin provided you can have your mind plan to extract it so they don't first have to extract um, this waste ore, I call it. And if we can drill down further there, um, three, four, a couple of levels there, and extend that um, asset, then you've got a very good tin opportunity if it checks out with tin processor close by in Poland. So, so it would make sense to continue that exploration and see what we, we find. I think as a as a small operation where, where we have on historic resources there, it, it's marginal. It's not, not marginal, you, you'll make money, but you're not gonna, you, nobody's getting rich of that. And then you've got um, Troyova in the west of the country. And Troyova is a very large antimony operation. That, that, that could be based on history, all based on historic resources. I have to put that caveat in. Based on historic resources, it's extremely exciting. One of the largest that could go into production um, in modern times. All right. And um, do you have drill permits and are you planning to do that exploration or or is it not permitting, but is it money? And, and where do you do? You know, no, it's, it's not what, what are the so deliverables we, for this year? Uh, yeah, where, so we, where we, we have going? exploration. We have exploration licenses. That that's not the the issue. Um, the issue is we first have to do a raise. Um, once we do a raise, we can start exploring those and prove up resources on that. So I mean, we don't we're not out of money. We've got a bit of money, but not enough to to start doing serious studies to a level where we would have the confidence to say, yeah, this is this is a this is a go no go decision. Um, so, so the objectives this year, raise money, do exploration, and do the confirmation work to advance the mining license. So the exploration would be the confirmation work. Okay. You, you, that, that, so the, the, you know, whether we want to extend that is, is a different topic. But if we can do confirmation work based on historic information which we've got, we can start making those decisions. All right. So what would the budget be for that and, and how much... <laughs> how much would you need to raise you need to raise significantly um that's always the question so what i was told and it's a back of the envelope calculation is you need to if you're going to put three of those assets and i'm not going to say three of those assets are you know worthy of being in production and we don't know yet we don't have that information but if you're going to start on those three assets you need to budget about 350 400 000 euros each to get to the, the point of pre-feasibility -feasibil study. So exploration, feasibility study, and um, test work to, to, to start applying for, for your mining classes. Or to, so 
that's where we need. So you need at least, our, and then you need some some buffer. So I would say you need about two million in order to that sounds remarkably actually go through. I guess so, that's because no, that's not take, that's taking you to the study point, right? Because what you need to do it is sequentially. If if all three are, are economic and the reserves are showing, the resources are showing, and it's like okay, then you start raising more. But if you say, all right, let's just test that on a preliminary basis, test that on a preliminary basis, open the edits, extend, and um, do some confirmation work, and start putting your resources together, that that will keep you going. All right. Uh, how much cash do you have in the bank right now? About half a million. All right. Um, and that takes me kind of the, the trading volume question. I was looking at the stock chart and it's the, the volume is really light. Uh, you know, it yeah. seems tough to raise money at these levels. And um, yeah, um, absolutely. So look, there's, you know, there's a couple of ways I, I end up only had because, you know, this requisition has taken up so much time. I've only had some very preliminary conversations with people in industry my ideal would be to raise it at the project level, to raise it at the Slovak level off the back of um, the strength of an offtake agreement. So development capital for that. That's, I mean, if you, if you had to say to me, what is your dream of how you want to get this, this done? I, I would say I want development capital of the strength of a strong offtake agreement um, where, you, where you pay back against, um, against revenue. Understood. Well, you did just, I saw in your news that you had some kind of offtake, but it's, it's preliminary. It's a, a memorandum yeah. of in, interest. Yeah, yeah. It? Look, it's not binding at this stage. Um, it's caused some upset in the market with other end users. Um, so, so that's, but there is, they're a very strong group, um, Scandinavian Steel. They're very strong distributors of antimony. Um, so we are excited. We are hopeful. Um, they haven't said no to to non-binding, so we, that's you know we'll start discussing sort of over the next six months whether we can upgrade that to to a binding situation or depend on other investors and and uh, people coming in. So at the moment, I mean, I, I live in Israel and they say Hakol Petuach, everything's everything's open. So you know we could raise it in the public markets, could raise it privately, um, we could raise it with offtake finance. It's it's a very niche opportunity. I would say it's a great opportunity um, right now because we'd be one of the only industrialized sources of antimony in nice countries. And that's the key, nice countries. I hear you. All right. Um, speaking of nice countries, uh, you mentioned West Gore before, uh, you know, completely different side of the pond and all that. Would that get exploration this year as well? Or what would the plan be there? Sorry, this I'm is waiting. the Nova Scotia project for the audience. Yeah, yeah no, I, I'm waiting. So at the moment, I've commissioned uh, David Murray, our geo, to um, digitize the core samples. So that should come in the next couple of weeks. Um, we need to follow up with that. And then he should be able to give us an estimation on, on what it's going to cost to get that to an NI43 101 resource. It doesn't matter if you're in Slovakia or in Canada, and if you want to call it NI43 101 or Slovakian standard, to move forward with any of these projects, you need a resource. The Slovakia is slightly easier because there's a historic resource at least, so you're confirming. Canada does not have a resource. So those are where we're at. But but both of those are, are if you want to decide to advance any of them, that's where you start. All right, very good. Okay, well, um, I always, wrap these interviews up with the skin in the game question if if you want investors to put their hard-earned money into the story we all want to, we want to know how much of your own money have you put in um i won't answer that in dollars but i will say that it's it's not free <laughs> shares have not been free i'll also say that out of the 17 million shares that are out 10 percent are mine directly and, and I've got to count in my head how many, three, four, five, another six million are controlled either by my family or um, by very close friends. All right, so, so significant interest aligned with shareholders. 
Uh, Lara, you've been a pretty good sport for some some penetrating questions here. So I'll give you the last word. What would you like the audience to take away from this interview? Oh, now you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's much much easier answering questions than than than, than summing up. I think what what I need to to probably um, articulate is that if we haven't already, we're we're in a age where there's unique opportunities for minor metals, and each one of those will have its day in the sun. And Timony is now having it, its day in the sun. I believe that on the fundamental side, it's sustainable. And and why I say that is because it's. It's a, it's a metal that has got a myriad of uses and industrial uses. So you're not pinning your hope on just batteries. Without the batteries, and, and the battery market right now for is pretty is pretty fledgling. Without the batteries, we're in a deficit market, arguably, where people are phoning me every single day. Every single day I go, we're not in production. We're not in production. And uh, the, the, there's the demand is out there and the demand is real and the substitutability is not easy. And, and that that's what you need to look for. And I, that's as my that's that's my analyst hat. When yeah, you study I understand. these metals, these minor metals, and I've, I've gone through them all, cobalt, lithium, rare earths, the whole gambit. When you when you're studying these minor metals, you look for what are the end uses, what are the end use markets doing, and what is substitutability of these. And that's what makes antimony compelling. Very interesting. Uh, I guess a real quick follow-up. Is there a website or an independent source that you could point the audience to for information about antimony besides your own website? <laughs> you know. um, Argus Media. They they cover antimony um, prices. And um, then there's another one, um, uh, something blue. He's also started, okay. uh, he, uh, it's a spinner from Roskill. He also started studying um antimony and then a lot of the um the contract prices even those payables which i was quoting to you um a lot of people follow the fast market prices um for antimony ingots so they they cover that news as well okay all right well thank you very much uh, good luck thank with you. your efforts and you know keep us posted thank you very much thanks for your time we will bye thank you for watching this edition of in the pit with lobo tigre if you enjoyed or found value in what you just saw and you're watching this on any sort of social media, please do hit the like button and the share link. Send this on to anybody you think might be interested. That helps us out a lot. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit the subscribe button as well. The number of subscribers helps us get more valuable content to you as well. On the subject of subscribing, I'll quickly say that if you're not a subscriber to our free weekly Speculators Digest, I encourage you to sign up. I promise if you do, we will not send you a flood of daily advertisements. You get one free weekly digest with original research not published anywhere else. Check it out at independentspeculator.com. Thank you and have a great day.